Corner, we're recording all these panels so that we get this information out to a wider audience. I know a lot of people are, you know, taking their option to recover from last night or the night before the accumulation of all that. Uh, one of the uh, areas in this whole shadow casting, I can say it, I can say it, uh, community is the Big Ten. The Big Ten and Akeowami has, you know, we've tried to be a leader in that, but we work with other casts like JCCP out there. And, uh, you know, we, we, we're finding more and more uh, across those. So we, you know, we do repo for genetic opera and shock treatment, Buffy, Dr. Horrible, Fireflies. We started doing Hedwig, uh, and I'm probably forgetting one, but, you know, The Room. The Room. Yes, The Room. We're doing that. Uh, but this cast doing other productions, the Tesseract plays of Boston, we'll be doing Princess Bride at our theater in September. So this shadow casting community has gotten wider and wider. Other casts are doing other things. And that's increased the size of the tent. But now we're gonna take that and swivel it sideways because now there's another area that I see is coming under the tent because a lot of people from the Rocky Horror Picture Show shadow casts have gotten involved with the Rocky Horror Show, and we've got people up here on that, and people from the Rocky Horror Show have gotten involved, they've come here. We've never had a panel act. Tell me what not to stand. You're good. Am I good? All right. So the Rocky Horror Show now, all right, you're doing incredible, there's nothing. Anyway, the Rocky Horror Show now is, I'm seeing this as something that's coming into our community. We're going into theirs, they're coming into ours, the tent covers everybody. So I wanted to just put that preface out there towards what we're talking about up here. Now we have, uh, to start this off, uh, we have a group down here, the uh, Rocky for Equality, and before I, Go any further, I you know like to you know tell us about your mission and what you do, and uh, then we'll go from there with more details. But an overall mission. Sure. Hello, um, my name is Becca, and I am the creator and director of Rocky for Quality, and we are a very small production company from Augusta, Maine, and we do an annual production of the Rocky Horror Show live. And we like to, when funds are available, uh, donate a portion of our proceeds to local nonprofits. Um, and we've worked with several in the area, uh, but that's that's what we do. I don't know how deep you want me to go into our donations. That's a good, well, good, yeah, get a little to that so we can, because once again, this is getting recorded. Sure. So if people wanted to contribute. Wherever. Yeah, so the first year that we did the show uh, was in 2011, and it was actually um, one of the first years that marriage equality was on the ballot in Maine. So we partnered with Equality Maine that year and had them tabling at our events and collected signatures and donated a portion of our proceeds to that nonprofit that year. Um, since then, we moved to the Augusta area. Our first show was up in northern Maine. And in the Augusta area, we have partnered with a local theater uh, called the Colonial Theater, and it has been shut down since 1979, I think, is when um, the theater went out of business, and it's been abandoned since then, and so they are restoring it. So we kind of partnered with them, and over the past few years, we've donated over $8,000 to their efforts to bring this theater back to life, and it's going to be the first arts community in the capital of Maine. So right now they don't have a theater space. So we're really excited to be working with them on that project until that stage is up and running. Thank you, okay. Hi, uh, why don't you fill in what your role is? Well, I am uh, Joe Tinkham, and I am involved because uh, when I met my amazing, beautiful wife, she kind of roped me in. I'm the uh, guitarist and musical director for the performances of um, Rocky Horror that happened in Maine for Rocky Horror Quality. I've been doing that since, I don't know, 2014, I think was, was the first year. We've been doing that every year up until this year when we switched and we didn't get the rights. We did Hedwig, which is great too. But um, So basically just the musical director piece of things. She handles the business and I don't get involved in that. 
Okay, well, that's, that's good teamwork. Uh, Zephyr, I'm gonna come back to, I wanna get back to the rights, but I wanna get a little more here, your perspectives on this, because you've been involved with performing in the play yourself. Yeah. As a uh, shadow caster going into the play, that's the other beginning. Yeah, which is kind of a weird transition. Uh, but I've been doing the Rocky Horror Picture Show for, I guess it's been about 10 years now. Um, and then uh, I, I decided to audition for a local production uh, here put on by Out Loud Theater, which is a wonderful group. Um, and then, honestly, it was kind of the first time I've ever like dipped my toes into the uh, water of the Rocky Horror Show. It was a uh, really kind of a surreal experience, like coming at all of this from a, a new angle. So this this is all because when we performed at uh, Super Mega Fest. Um, Pat Quinn and, and Barry Bostwick were there and they sat through the whole thing and I was talking with Barry after the show and he said, have you ever done it on stage? I said, no, I haven't. And he said, you should. And he said, you, you got you to gotta audition for it. So I promised Barry I would and that was the reason um, that I auditioned. Uh, so I, I auditioned for Frank but ended up getting cast as Rocky, uh, which was also kind of a challenge um, because that, that part is... It, it compared to what it is in the play, almost non-existent in the film. Like it's just so much of it is just cut out, um, it, and you kind of understand why when you start getting into the day. Like some of those lines are uh, fucking weird. <laughs> they're they're weird. Yeah, like why would you say that? Why wouldn't you say that? <laughs> uh, now, Ray, you actually had the experience. You got a lot of background on this over in Europe, where clearly the Rocky Horror Show is the thing. Yeah. And it's not the Rocky Horror Picture Show as much. Yeah. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, well, I'm a theater professional. I've been doing theater since I was a kid, and I've traveled. Um, a big part of my focus in studying theater was the Rocky Horror Show. I've been studying it for about 13 years now, the stage show, and I was fortunate enough to get to travel to Europe and see it in Sweden and the UK, um, which were both radically different productions compared to what's in the U.S. Um, and I've seen it all over the U.S. as well. Um, but Sweden in particular was a next level experience. So it was, yeah, it's just, it's great because there's so much directorial freedom with the play compared to the film. And you can take it in basically any direction. It can be a comedy, it can be a farce, it can be a horror story. Like, it's, it's just amazing what people do with the piece. Yeah, I, I mean, over the years, I don't know how many people out there have seen uh, you know, different versions of the Rocky Horror Show. My first experience was in 1980, and it was up at the uh, the Future Theater of the Full Body Cast, uh, the Boston Cast at the time, at Harvard Square. And uh, you know, that was one way. Uh, and you, I've just seen so many variations of it. Uh, that's interesting. Like when when you perform it, do you what, what what's your angle on it? So when I started doing it, um, and I've been involved with the live production now for almost 16 years. And so I started doing it at a repertory theater in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And what was interesting is that they did it as their midnight production, but they also had a main stage show at 8 o'clock. So they would do these shows in rep, and they needed to make the set work for both. So when I grew up seeing the show every summer, and when I actually ended up working at that theater they would change the theme, like you said, there's so much freedom, and they would change the theme to kind of fit whatever main stage show they were doing. So the summer that I worked there, for example, we did Little Shop of Horrors, Pajama Game, and Rocky Horror. So it was a, a meld of all three of those. And then when I started my own company, I kept that idea, and every year we try to go in a different direction, whether it be a comedy or a, you know, be true to the uh, be horror flick, style. Um, last year we did a carnival theme and kind of went in that direction and we have shirts here from last year's show and you can, yeah it was very vaudeville and you can see like every year we try to do something different um, because we don't want anybody to see the same show twice which is such a different world from the shadow cast because that's exactly what you're doing is reproducing that show and we try to do something completely different and take the story and put it in a different spin in a new world. New York graffiti was... Yeah, we've done urban graffiti. Rocky, Rocky was born out of the front of a car. Yes, that was really great. Rocky's Rocky's womb was a hood of a car, um, and so the hood of a car lifted during that whole scene, and we had a fog machine geyser come up, and he came out of the hood of the car. It was awesome. That was probably my favorite birth that we've ever done. That's incredible. I, I that's wow. I mean, it makes sense, but I not. 
Yeah. <laughs> not until you see it, it does. <laughs> and then not even then, so. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'll, I'll just throw in there too, because there, it, it's interesting that, that you say that. There were so many conversations when um, we did our version about like, you know, we, we do all these kind of creative exercises around it, and then a lot of people like sit around in a, tur uh, a circle and just kind of, uh, you know, bounce their ideas and, and what they took away from it. And I thought it, it was interesting. So many people were like, I wonder what this means. Like, what's, what's the meaning? And then at, at a certain point, I think we all kind of agreed like, Guys, Rocky doesn't mean anything. Like, there's zero, there's zero meaning to this, and any meaning that you put is just what you're ascribing to it. So, in, in a lot of ways, I think the piece is kind of a, a blank canvas. Like, you just put, you put whatever you want on there. It's not, it's not a pre-built template. Like at its base, and what Rich O'Brien has said in interviews, at the base of the Rocky Horror Show is that it is an Adam and Eve story, um, with Brad and Janet as Adam and Eve, and Frank as the snake. So, and that's just that's just a trope that's used in so many pieces of theater that it's just, it, it, it is a blank slate um, in that respect. Well, and that blank slate and that freedom is why it appeals to so many people. And that's why we have this community, I think, because everybody can make from it what they want to make from it. And that's what brings us all together. In your experience, because uh, you're coming from the play side of it, and we've had, we have people who have gone to the play. Have you seen that up there too? Like, people who are shadow casters trying to get involved? So the shadow cast really isn't very popular in Maine. The show itself isn't really popular in Maine. I had to work really hard to get it started. Um, like I said, I grew up in, in on the border of New Hampshire and we did the live show, but then when I went to school, they did the shadow cast um, at the University of Maine at Farmington and that was the only place I knew of that really did it. Um, so there's a shadow cast that does it at the college every year and then a shadow cast up in Northern Maine every year and they come see our shows, but none of them have really crossed over or auditioned. And I think that's because we're so spread out. Um, it's it's Maine. Maine's big. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it is. Okay. Let's get back now. I want. I said I get back to this. Uh, I mean, with Rocky Hour Picture Show, some this part of the Rocky Hour Picture Show shadow casting. It's a bit of a wild, wild west. I mean, it started out with movie theaters, but now everybody's got laptops and. That. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's showing up in bars and barns and, and, you know, you could do it in your backyard, you know. So, but with the play, uh, you know, that, that might be, that's a hill to climb from what I gather. It's a, it's a hill to climb to get the rights and all that. And can you, I don't know if you know about any numbers, but, you know, what would be the challenge of trying to get this thing going financially? So. Legally. Yeah, legally, um, Samuel French currently holds the rights to the production, um, and it is a process. You do have to fill out an application and apply for the rights where you have to talk about the price of your tickets, how many seats you have available, um, where you're located, and it's not a guarantee that you're going to get those rights. In fact, we just ran into the issue this year where for the first time in 16 years, I was unable to get the rights to the show, um, and we ended up doing Hedwig and the Angry Inch as a replacement, but... Um, was awesome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it was a good fit, but you know, you aren't ever guaranteed the show, and it does cost a significantly more money than to do the the shadow cast and to just be able to play the movie. We have between 100 and 200 seats available, um, and we do four shows. We do two weekends on Friday and Saturday nights, so we have the capacity of 400 to 800 people, and the rights cost us anywhere between 1800 to $2,500, just for the rights alone. For, for, for every night or just for the whole thing? For the whole thing, okay. yeah. Okay. And that varies based on how many people you have, like how, what your seating capacity is and what your ticket price is, so that varies. Well, it, and, so, and the other thing is, because it's not a shadow cast, the, the, the cost of a venue is gonna be significantly more than where you may do it elsewhere as well, so you run into uh, thousands of dollars for that, so it takes the cost up substantially. Is there any, any attention given to charities and, you know, the fact that, like, hey, we're, we're not getting rich off this, and if we're trying to donate to a charity, is that, do you feel that comes into play, or is it like, no? I it's wish. Mean, it's mean. <laughs> I wish that that came into play. Um, it does. We we have a lot of local businesses that have helped us out. Um, like last year, we ended up we didn't have to really pay anything for our set. We had a local lumber company that said, "Hey, this is cool. I can't believe you're doing that. Like, how can we help?" 
Let so me you're tell you. getting sponsorships, but in essence, by from the actual distribution of the rights to play it's this business. Yeah, you, you have to pay for the rights. They're really strict about it. They have very strict rules about, you know, how you promote the show, uh, how you list it on your playbill. Um, your posters have to say certain things. I mean, there's a whole laundry list of, of rules that you need to follow, and that's with any theater production. Um, but it's different from people that may come from the shadow cast world where there's a lot more freedom um, and you're not tied into those rights that you have to purchase for the live production. Well, yeah, I mean, in shadow casting, it's, I don't consider it our business. That's up for the venue, but uh, that's between them. But now, Zephyr, you, you just recently did the Rocky Hour show in a tiny uh, yeah. room, actually. I, I wonder if there was a different... It, you don't know this. Uh, it, oh, I can tell you, it was the, the rights issue was very much there. Everybody had... Um, so we only got so many music books um, and the music books were all like, they're labeled with like, Out Loud Theater, Rocky Horror Show, this is the date that it's happening, this is the serial number of this book. And like, you cannot take pictures of the music or f photocopy the music or anything. Even, I'm sure it all exists for free outline on the internet, but like, it's all like watermarked and serial number, like, and I remember thinking at one point, like, like oh man, Roy would be losing his goddamn mind if this was, <laughs> Uh, there, there's just so much red tape about like we had to give all the books back and uh, yeah, you know you like you can write on them or do whatever you want with them but it, it, like that's your book and you can't lose it and we're gonna know and Going the yeah the the musical police will come. From what I've heard about Samuel French in general, even with other productions outside of Rocky, is that they're very stringent about their rights in general, uh, more so than MTI or other other uh, production companies. Can you clear this up? That's one thing I, I guess now you know, I just you're actually doing it. I, I have heard of Richard O'Brien still has those rights, so he he's out of loop. Yeah. Um Richard O'Brien doesn't get involved in the movie. He doesn't get any money from the movie. He sold the rights to Fox, so he has nothing to do with it. That's why he doesn't come here. He's very involved in the Rocky Horror Show in Europe. He performs as the narrator a lot in the UK tour. He's he goes to the conventions and stuff for the stage show, but he just he's not involved in the movie anymore. So it's just that's why on um all the posters, it says Richard O'Brien's Rocky Horror Show rather than just the Rocky Horror Show. Um, in, in, the, in the UK and in Germany and in Sweden where they perform it, it's always Richard O'Brien's Rocky Horror Show. That's like the full name of the play. What about uh, the culture? I'm always like, we have a culture with all these casts, you know, and, and even the casts are very different from each other. And we come here together and kind of compare a lot. But, like, is there something like the culture there, like, you just, like, your group has kind of returned every year to do it, so that must give you a sense of cohesiveness, maybe a sense of family on this, you know, where you, you all know each other and you're coming back to do it. Sure. But is it a more close, because it's, it's a play and it's once a year, is it more close-knit or? It's very close-knit. We're absolutely a family and there's a, there's a huge community that we've created. Um, since we started, this was our sixth production um, that we've done, it was our sixth season, and we've had over 70 performers throughout those six productions, um, which is incredible. And almost all of them are still involved in some way, whether it's auditioning the next year or working front of house or volunteering for the merch table or just helping us spread the word online. Um, and we are, have also created a community with our audience members as well. And we're starting to see those same people come back year after year. Um, and our audience is growing. Last year was the first year that we sold out the show, which was monumental for us. Um, and it's because we're creating that community. And that's what Rocky Horror has always meant to me, was that community where we create an environment where people can feel welcome and accepted and just be free to be themselves. Right. That's interesting to me because it's like we're so... Yeah, I, I feel like almost like this, like a, like distant cousins or something. Like we should, like we're doing it here now. You're here, but you know, like I say, we're we're a big believer in the big tent and bringing. I just think the two communities together. Like why not? You know, and that's why I'm hoping we can. I don't know if there's any type of conventions for the Rocky Hour show. Probably, it like your community's more maybe to your group, your specific group rather than other groups out there that do it. 
Yeah, um, yes, I would say that. Audience, I think, is pulling from the larger community, from yeah. people that are fans of the Shadowcast. Yeah. We've had people come from Canada. We've had people come from Massachusetts, New Hampshire. I mean, we've had people come just because they know what you guys do. They know the Shadowcast, and they know the movie, and they want to check out, you know, the original production. But do you have, like, relationships with other Rocky Horror casts? No, there really aren't that many. I mean, like I said, the college does it, but that's different students every year because those are just students coming and going through school. And then um, the, the shadow cast that does it up in northern Maine, um, the woman who plays Frankenfurter there every year, she's been very involved with our production. But really, there's I think it's because we're so spread out, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Do you think there's ever going to be an opportunity where, or do you think it would make sense to actually have a Rocky Horror show be part of a Rocky Horror Picture Show convention weekend. Actually putting on a full on production, having a, a house come build out a full Rocky Horror show, would that be something that we as Rocky Horror Picture Show con attendees would embrace? Is it possible? Could it happen? Why hasn't it happened? Go. That's a great question. I mean, those of you here yesterday uh, saw us do a uh, a version, you know, of uh, you know, RKO Horror Picture Show, and he's well attended. I, I'll probably get feedback about what they thought of it, but uh, to just go all the way with that and actually, uh, you know, get up and perform it because that would impew upon the convention the rights issue and all that. But you know, yeah. that's not insurmountable. I, no. what you're talking about. I think that also comes with some extra hurdles, though, because one thing about doing you know, a show like Shock Treatment or, or Rocky or a Picture Show is it's, it's kind of a pre-built template, right? Like, the obviously, different casts have, like, slightly different things. Like, oh, we don't usually do, you know, this part, or, like, oh, usually we come in from over here. But for the most part, like, 90% of it is the same staging, the same costumes. So, really, I could go to almost any cast in the country and just drop right in and, and do it. Yeah. Like maybe there'd be a couple of bumps, but you could do that. When you start from scratch and there's nothing, like that's a lot to figure out. You know, like. I, I, would, I would say it probably have to be the convention built around an already running Rocky yeah. Horror show. The, the, the yeah. tech, the tech this, oh, I'm sorry, thank you, yes, I yell. The tech, I, I mean alone, the lights, the sound, We when we do Hell Week before production, um, you're, you're often taking a band, um, even though we do very often the same band members. But we're taking a band that hasn't probably spent much time with the cast and the lights folks are setting up with the sound folks that may be different from the year before with a stage that's still being built behind you. Bringing that into a situation like this, could you pull it off? Yes. I'm not but, saying bring, bring, the, bring uh, the show to the convention, I'm saying bring the convention to a, to a so, show. That, I'm not gonna lie, I said exactly that last night. We were at the dance and I said, I wanna do a con. And I wanna have RKO Army come and do shock treatment and Dr. Horrible and do their Rocky Horror Shadow Cast and then the main event would be our show. And I think that's exactly right. Interesting idea. Is that you would have to bring it to an existing, right. instead of, I mean, although it's possible for us to come to a venue like this, we would well, need- let's talk like, let's say, okay, we've got a stage here, we've got a screen. Right. You suddenly have to adapt. To we would have to- What um, rehearsal would that take to just get up here and- Well, we would just need to know ahead of time is, okay, what's your stage gonna look like? And then we would make a set and we would rehearse with that in mind, because that's kind of what we do anyway. So we actually don't have the luxury of having our own space. So we rent a venue, and so we rehearse anywhere we can get a room. Right. Um, and we will tape out on the floor what our stage is gonna look like, and then we go into that space and we have only a day or two, a couple days to put that all together. It would be the same kind of thing. So if we knew what the con was going to look like and we knew what the venue was going to look like, we would just prepare for that and design our set to be a pop-up set in that space. I think light, lighting scenes. That's the biggest obstacle, as I would think. Um, yeah. As opposed to just having the movie playing and, and using that as your, your scenery and your lighting. I mean, we spend a lot of time and a lot of money programming lights um, and live music for the show. So that would be an obstacle as well. But uh, if you're bringing a con to that environment, then that absolutely works. And then it would just be, it's doable to do it traveling. 
Hey, well, if we raise the money to, to rent out the place for a week, we'll bring it to Maine. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, right. you talk about getting the wheels turning. <laughs> the beautiful thing about the stage show being. Yeah. Well, that, that's, look, part of the whole thinking of the Big Ten is like, you know, one of the favorite things before we started actually doing other productions back in the 80s, let's say, people would talk about, what if we did that? What, what if we did Star Wars? What if, whatever. We, you know, and then the first few we did was, uh, you know, the walk, no, what is it, the, uh, the zombie ones there. I mean, darkness, yeah, and, uh, you know, it wasn't, not, if you saw it, it wasn't at the level we do things now, but, I, uh, yeah, I, that would be, well, we won't make any decisions today, but, um, you know, I mean, that combination, I think it would have to be, a convention would have to go to the play. Exactly, yeah. and maybe, yeah. maybe there's two showings, the, the, the Friday night is the Rocky Horror Show, the Saturday night is the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Well, I think what they're yeah. saying is that the main event would, would lead it, the Saturday night would be the Rocky Horror Show instead of the movie. Well, I think yeah. you could do Well, you could, well, it's a lot of Rocky Horror, but... A lot of Rocky Horror, but... Yeah. All the, uh, the beautiful thing about the stage show being so flexible as well is that you can do it on a bare stage, too because the original productions in um, London and in uh, LA and on Broadway as well, they didn't really have a set. It was just a screen and like the Coca-Cola machine that Eddie popped out of. Um, and that was basically it. Um, so it's it's easy to do like without a set. And Out Loud didn't have much of a set either. We had no set. Yeah, yeah. literally it was like ensemble members were all of the props. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was the tire of Brad and Janet's car, so I would just somersault across the stage <laughs> And there were like three other people somersaulting around me and someone was like the windshield wipers and somebody was the headlights. And then when the car broke down, everybody just collapsed and uh, my, it was good. My favorite thing about that production was that you guys all formed the gun that yeah. kills Frank. I yeah. thought that was so cool. Yeah, <laughs> the, the whole concept of that piece was very like, you know, kind of the, the ensemble is like this primordial ooze. So we were all part of the ensemble. And then, like different characters would kind of get pulled or created out of the ooze. Yeah. Um, when I got created as Rocky, it was very cool because every like everyone was kind of scattered throughout the room. It was theater in the round, yeah. and so then everybody would just turn and look at me on one cue, and like the whole ensemble would kind of like come up and consume me, and then like birth Rocky. It was weird. It was some weird shit, <laughs> um, but it was good. And and, and that's you know to, to the point of flexibility. Like we did it with no set, um, and, and I think that's kind of true of the the movie as well. Like if I think about some of the places that we've done it, um, you know, we've done it outside at a drive-in in front of a thousand cars. We've done it at the stadium, which we'll be at tonight. We've done it uh, in bars. I've done it in front of three people. I've done it in front of like, you know. Pizza a, places. Yep, a pizza, <laughs> pizza joint. Sandwich shops. Sandwich shops, uh, run down movie theaters, uh, big chain movie theater, like all of it, all of it. I can say the Wild West, it's, uh, you know. You could, you could literally take the show anywhere. Like, everybody's got their costumes. Do you have a screen? Do you have a sound system? Go. Yep. Basement, I mean, that's. Yeah. yeah. So now you're doing, you did Hedwig. Was this the first time you veered off Rocky Horror? Or? Yes. Um, so it was a big move for us. Um, we knew that we wanted to work it into our rotation because of its, you know, similarities and it's a lot of the same overlap in audience members and, and fan base. So we were planning to work it into our rotation in the future and then when we were unable to get the rights to Rocky Horror, it kind of forced our hand a little bit. Um, and it's a, it's a very different production. So with Rocky, I usually have a cast of anywhere from 15 to 20 people. And as you know, Hedwig's a cast of two. So it was, it was a big change for us. Um, we definitely saw um, a difference in the audience. Um, not as many people were familiar with it, and so it was, you know, we had to recreate, you know, we have to find people and teach them about the show, which is kind of how we started Rocky, because like I said, Rocky's not super familiar in Maine. Um, so when we first started Rocky for Equality, we really had to teach our audience about what this show is and what this community is. Um, and now we're gonna start that process with Hedwig. What was the psychological effect on the cast? Like, was it like invigorating to do something different? Or? I think so. Um, I wish he was in here, but our Hedwig is here today. Um, he's out in the hallway at our merch table, but you should. He played Frank in Furter last year, and he played Hedwig this year, so um, we can ask him what his opinion is between the different. Well, the reason I ask is because we, 
you know, there was an, there's an internal argument in our community, and we're clearly on one side of it. We believe that great people can do more than one thing, and it doesn't detract from the main thing. Absolutely. You know, it, 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 you know it's just, you know, why limit people? And I, we have found, in our case, and for those of you here before Repo last night, uh, for those of you here before Repo, Diz Foster was up here, and, and they were talking about, you know, like people getting involved with Repo and getting involved with Rocky Horror. We've had people come into our other shadow cast and then they eventually get involved with Rocky Hara. And uh, I'm just thinking it might increase the size of this community that you have and all that. So my question that we dragged you in here for, I'm proud to. Where am I? <laughs> my question was, you know, doing Hedwig this time, it was the first time you veered off the Rocky Horror show. Mm -hmm. Was it mentally invigorating to do something different and, and take your, like it's, you're ready to go back and do Frank and Ferner, but now you did this, was it, did you feel like it was stimulating you? Oh, absolutely. I adored doing Hedwig so much. Um, I have so much heart for John Cameron Mitchell's words and, and uh, the music that Stephen Trask wrote, and I adored singing the show and find, I, I adore Rocky and, and all its permutations, everything it can be every time I do it and how changeable and malleable it is. And, but I also adored the depth of, of the Hedwig story. So it didn't take away from your feeling for performing Rocky Hara. It's all. just expanding your own personal horizons. Uh, so it might even keep you involved longer because there's more to do. It's analogous in a way, of course, the spirit of, you know, doing whatever the fuck you want to do, you know, dressing yeah. however, however you want to dress, and, and of course the rock and roll soundtrack, the two shows have in common, I think, that for for modern musicals that you can put on nowadays, they both just are a ton of fun musically, and they rock so much, and it's I... a double picture show. Right, we need a double feature, yeah. yeah. Let me ask you this, uh, there's been some backlash in the community about you know, what's going on on the screen up there and, you know, things that we used to laugh at in the 70s and 80s and Frankfurt is going in and he's not consensually, you know, doing stuff there. Uh, that's the movie. It was made in 1975. That's the movie. We can't change the movie. You know, we still love this thing. We want to have fun with it. You know, trying to work through that. With the play, you, as you said earlier, you can do what you want. Do you, have you ever found, you've been doing this many years now, have you been affected by anything exterior? Like, maybe we should get away from that in the next version we do and kind of do this instead. So, I haven't really encountered it too much. Um, nobody's complained, nobody has said anything. Um, but we, as a cast, have talked about some of the callbacks um, and some of the callbacks that made some of our cast members uncomfortable that we stopped using. But in terms of doing the show, we do the show as it was written, which is very similar to the movie. And I think what's important is just how we present ourselves as a group outside of the show um, and, you know, how we support those issues in the community as opposed to when we're doing the show, which is a piece of art that is written the show was from 1970, movie 1975. Like, it is what it is, but it's how we present ourselves as people afterwards and as members of this community and how we can be forward thinking in those changes and still appreciate the art for what it is. Thank you for saying that because that's a, it's a I think some people, you know, we're trying to work our way through it too. And, and that's an outstanding way how you present yourself personally and your own personal conduct is what counts. Uh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, let me open it up a little bit. Uh, you know, if anybody has any topics that, you didn't, that you'd like to see covered, or anybody got anything on? Yes, sir. I just you mentioned the callbacks. I just was wondering, you know, sometimes people aren't familiar with the show. Do you have someone prompting callbacks or doing anything like that? So when we first started, it was me. Uh, I was the only one yelling things in the back of the room. Um, because I had been doing it for so long um, in Portsmouth, and so I brought all those callbacks that I knew, and they've caught on. Like I said, we've had over 70 performers 
do the show with us. They all know the callbacks now. Um, we've had repeat on. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> You've ruined my story. Sorry. <laughs> Make me a liar. But the, the cast has learned them. Our audience members that come back year after year have learned them. And like I said, we do have people from the shadow cast community that do travel to come see our show. Um, last year was really fun. We had a gentleman from a New York shadow cast come and he actually threw my cast off a couple of times because they were hearing callbacks they'd never heard before. And it was so much fun um, to just have another perspective from a different area of the country come in from a shadow cast performer um, and bring new life into those callbacks. But yeah, it, the community's growing, they're learning as we grow as a company. There, there's also that same, I, I just thinking about the callbacks, the way that some of them would kind of pop up organically. Um, with these sort of in jokes with the cast, uh, which I know we've seen all the time, like people will make a joke about the cast member rather than about you know the characters or something like that. Um, and there was just a, this awesome example. Uh, our narrator was played by uh, Ted Clement, is is the guy's name. He was fantastic. And somebody it, on the line, inclement weather. Somebody in the audience yelled out, "Ted Clement weather." And I, that was the closest I've ever come to breaking on stage. I was like, fuck, that's good. Um, also, noticing um, in the UK, the stage show is king. So like the way that we treat the movie here is how they treat the stage show there. So the stage show has its own set of AP that's completely different. Um, also with the Broadway revival from 2000 as well. Um, so there are lines that are specific to the stage show um, with stuff like, because Rocky has lines in it, so there's lines about that. Like I, I said before, a womb with a view. Um, it, no, it was a, this room is a womb to me, and I said it's a womb with a view. So it's, it's stuff like that, and there's just these little jokes that just come from those lines as well, so that don't work with the film. <laughs> I see a hand out there. Yeah, so um, I had never realized that people will scream callbacks during like the play production, because whenever I have like heard or seen like the play, um, it's always been, you know, on a stage, like, kind of like a Broadway, Kennedy Center type deal. Um, and so I guess, like, what I'm saying is, do you feel like you're your own community separate from, like, other people performing the play? Or do you feel like those people are just, like, doing it in a one-off time frame? So that's a great comment slash question. Um, it's a very different world between like a Broadway yeah. quality level performance versus what we do. What we do is a lot more similar to the pizza place performance of a shadow cast. You know, we are not a big fancy theater venue. We're a very small scale show and we like to create intimacy and we encourage those callbacks. So part of our ticket process and part of our promotion of the show is talking about the audience participation. And we have a whole page about it on our website and when you purchase the tickets, it says what to expect at the show. And we talk about props because there's a difference between props with the movie and props with our show. Um, we don't allow a lot of the props because of the safety of our equipment and our actors, um, because there's a lot more going on on stage and a lot more equipment on stage, but we do allow some props that are not dangerous. So we make sure to mention that for people who may be coming from a shadow cast background. Um, and we talk about the callbacks and we, um, we say that they can go to some websites to get examples of the callbacks. We try to prepare them before they come in. But there was another theater that um, Jack actually performed in their production. He played Frankenfurter in Waterville, um, about a half an hour away from we perform. And they just did. It's not an annual show that they're going to do every year. They just did it as a one-off. And they actually weren't going to allow costumes or callbacks. Um, and then they got so much backlash that they ended up saying, just kidding, you were going to have a costume contest and callbacks are welcome because right. people were so Thank, thank God people did not listen to them. They were just like, please be quiet, except for on the weekend performances and Halloween night itself, and everybody else was just like, slide, asshole. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I am so used to the, and this is kind of a weird um, gap to bridge, I think, between the theater and the, the shadow cast is like, you know, there was a point in rehearsal where people started talking about like, oh man, like, people are going to come in and yell shit at us while we do this, that's gonna be weird. And I was like, yeah guys, it's gonna be real weird. Um, <laughs> what's that gonna be like? Um, it, it, and there was also, I felt like, at least in the audience that we get, almost like a hesitance to do it. Um, you know, our director would kind of get up before uh, every show and say like, yeah, you're welcome to you know, yell shit out. But I, I, I felt like, I don't know if you guys run into this at all, I think with the shadow cast, people are so like, 
that's the thing, right? That's its reputation. Like everybody knows, even if you've never seen the movie, oh, you go to the Rocky Horror Show and people are like being rambunctious and yelling shit and like throwing stuff and like that's kind of part of it. But I felt like some of the audiences in the show were like, you know, somebody would yell something out and then like the audience would laugh and there'd kind of be this moment of like, oh, is that okay? Like, are we, are we allowed to do that? Because you, you don't do that at a theater, right? That's rude, <laughs> but but it's okay at the show. And I, I felt like there was kind of that like breaking of ice, like you kind of have to get the audience of like, no, it is okay. You absolutely can do that. We, we, we've gotten to the point that, uh, especially if you're Frankenfurt, you better be prepared because the band is going to yell some very perverse <laughs> things at you from on stage. So it becomes kind of a... Uh, you know, that, that increases the likelihood that the, that the audience is going to participate. It's just everybody's yelling at callbacks. I think it's wonderful. I know it is a change in culture, though. Huge change in culture. I know the protocol um, that the director sets forward in um, the UK production is that the only people allowed to interact with audience participation are the narrator and Frank. Um, so Frank kind of has that freedom to improv a little bit and play with the audience just because that works for the character. I've never specifically said that, but it really only seems to be Frankenfurter and the narrator that will interact back. Yeah. Yeah. Like a. Uh, yeah. It's like a strip club. We can touch you, but. Yeah. You can't touch us, and we say that in our rules. Yeah. <laughs> This is incredible, though, because, I mean, you know, those of us who have been in this community long or short time, where I think one of the best things about it is that opportunity for creativity. And I'm just all about, I'm just so glad you guys came down because, you know, we're trying to, we're, we're, like I said, I said, we're merging, getting people under the Big Ten. And you're seeing what we're doing, and you're already, your wheels are turning. And now you tell us, you know, you get our wheels turning. And we're not making any exact plans right now, but I, I think one of the most fun parts of this community, I mean, like the pre-shows, the, the video pre-shows last night, the live pre-shows you're gonna see tonight. I mean, I just, I know just the RKO one, like the time of rehearsal they put in for that. You know, the stakes are high, and, you know, because you've run one, you know, in 2016, it's, the stakes are high, but uh, it, it's, I guess the thing about this is like-minded people getting together. That's what we're all about, bringing people under the tent, and uh, that's exciting, you know, and I, yeah, we'll be having a lot of dis uh, discussion. Yes, Kika. Uh, I just want to say I've never gotten to see uh, the stage show of Hedwig and the Angry Ranch or the Rocky Horror Show, um, but uh, I want to know who is producing a run of either of those shows and ending it with a uh, Rocky Horror Convention. Do I have to do it? Do I, have I mentioned it enough times yet? Unprecedented ground. It'd be beautiful because I feel like as a Rocky Horror Show person, I would love to experience everything that goes into the Rocky Horror Show. And they, they are different. And I think that they would work really well right next to each other and you'd have a full house of crazy people experiencing something that really hasn't been done yet. So I think somebody should do it. We weren't joking about the idea of doing that. Back to back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no reason why it's, you know, the, the main event can't be a play one night and a movie. Uh, there's actually, um, I, I, there's no rule on this. So. Well, actually, I think um, it's no longer a joke. <laughs> yeah, no, Static from um, FBC actually is, he, I, I don't know if he has already or if he's running a production where it's the Shadowcast one night and the play the other night. So it's just, it's not like a convention, but it is something that he has done or is currently doing. Okay. But I don't know too much about that, so you have to ask him about it, but yeah. Well, uh, any other questions? I don't wanna, yes, John. I'm just curious, a lot of your performers are involved in other musical theater, or is it primarily Um, It's interesting because uh, I think the majority, it's probably half and half of, of we got theater people who came to do the show because they just wanted to audition for a musical, and then the other half was people who are maybe t intimidated by theater and had never tried it before, but felt more comfortable trying it with Rocky because it was something that uh, was a little less scary, a little more familiar. Um, so I think about half of our actors that first year had never done a show before in their lives, and they were just trying it because they know Rocky and they just wanted to try something new. And then the other half were performers from other local theaters. Um, Jack does other local productions. Um, some of our other actors that are here have come from other backgrounds. I do other musical theater. I've done other 
theater my whole life, so. Yeah. What's the show that you're involved in next now? It's kind of a 180 from... Oh my god, I'm I am choreographing My Fair Lady, let me tell you. <laughs> it's gonna be a change. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird it's a weird planet to crash onto. Wonderful planet Janet for a while and then have to go do something completely non-analogous to Rocky Horror. So it's a lovely oasis to return to that you know will always be there. <laughs> do you two perform in the show or are you just uh, directors? So... <laughs> I had to perform in our 2014 production. Um, our magenta got arrested and wow. went to jail. Yeah, that'll happen. So <laughs> we were like, what do we do now? Uh, I guess I know all the lines, I'll do it. Um, but I'll let Joe talk about his role. My role? Uh, yeah, we, we just, um, so Rocky Horror to me, I didn't want to do this. <laughs> And it's not that I didn't like it, but like I knew Rocky Horror because in the 90s, like VH1, when I was in college, would always have like, oh, it's, you know, around El Rinto. And then she said, well, I want to do this. This is something from my world I'm going to bring in. And I was like, all right, well, I love like really technical 80s music because that's what I grew up on. So how are we going to make this a rock show, not like... Not like the productions I see her in where you hear the band out back and there's the, the drummer and the people you can't see, but how are we going to make this loud and like you're coming to a rock show? And so that was, that was the whole idea. So actually getting to perform with her was actually kind of a, a dream come true because it was like she got to be in a, a singing role and, and I got to play. And that was actually a really cool thing to be able to pull off that we didn't expect to happen. So that's a round What's that? Yeah, the, yeah, the band's on stage, so, we're, so we're, we're together. So that was our one time really performing together, and I hope we actually get to do it again. So. Jay Chris, you got a question back there. I do. The look and feel of the Rocky Horror Show, uh, as well as the Rocky Horror Picture Show, is very, very much driven from Sue Blaine, the costume designer. Uh, over the years, lots of different productions have intentionally chose to take elements of the her designs and incorporate that into her production, and other productions have specifically decided to not include elements of her designs into their production. What do you think is a best strategy for that? And if so, are there certain iconic costume pieces that have to be in the show? Well, um, I am somewhere in the middle. Um, I mentioned earlier that we always do a different theme every year that we do the show so that we're not doing the same production twice and we always put a different spin on it. So my costumes tend to take the, the pieces that were from the original, but then how do they fit the theme now? Really the thing that's always the most important to me is um, Frank's costumes. He's always got to have a big reveal where part of his costume is torn away whether it's the cape or we've done all kinds of other things. I can't think of anything now, but every year we do something that relates to the theme. So his big reveal always needs to have a costume piece. Yeah, in, in 2016 we had our, our Frank, who's here now, to uh, begin in the audience as sort of an incognito audience member. And, and at that part of the program she got up and shed her garments and came strutting forward. And I think it was effective. I didn't that, recognize her and I sat like <laughs> Isle, Isle it seemed to elicit the right shock from everyone in this vicinity. <laughs> yeah, so definitely Frank's reveal costume and then the floor show. We always try to pull elements from the floor show. Um, but we theme it to whatever the theme of our production is. But we always want them to be recognizable as Rocky Horror, too. So I I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle. There, I think there, there are costumes that are so kind of, uh, they're icons, like they're so steeped at like you, you know, the Frankenfurters, the black horse and the Rocky's got the little gold shorts and the Janet. And, and I think, I, I think it really depends on kind of what you're trying to do, you know, with the production. Like I've seen, I've seen some people really do it really close to the movie where they're just kind of trying to be as close as they can to the film on stage. Uh, and I've seen other productions where, you know, I know our, our, our kind of philosophy was let's get as far away as possible from that. Uh, we got to sit down with the costume designers early on in the process and they were like, what do you, what do you want? And I was like, not gold shorts. <laughs> like, just literally let's do anything else. And she was like, I'm so glad you said that because I did not want to do gold shorts. So uh, 
We did gold shorts for the first um, few years, but then in 2016, when we did Urban Graffiti, um, Rocky was in a American flag bikini. Um, and last year, our theme was vaudeville, and Rocky was actually birthed and born out of a um, jack-in-the-box. And he was like a ventriloquist dummy. So he had the little shorts with gold on them, but it wasn't the classic gold shorts. So it, we took an element, and then he had, she had gold pasties on um, to bring a little bit of the rocky gold in there as well. But I'm curious what they do in Europe. Oh, yeah. Well, the UK production is also designed by Sue Blaine. It's slightly different from the movie. Like, at first glance, it looks like the movie costumes, but if you look at it kind of closer, it's, it's a little different. Like, their Columbia um, tailcoat has leopard print lining. So it's, it's just like little things like that. But in Sweden, they just brought it to like an entirely new place. Uh, Rocky was played by a bigger guy and he was wearing a full pink leotard and like had a pink beard and curly hair. Um, Janet came out after Tatcha wearing a barrel with a dildo on it and topless with Mickey Mouse ears and like crazy makeup. So it's like, and like Brad came out in s and gear with like bad words written all over him and stuff. So it's like they literally like did an entirely different thing. So I, I just have to ask. This is for me, not for anybody. Because because nudity is more acceptable over there. Yeah. Is there is there any actual like? No, she was completely top. topless. She, That's what I was. She's yeah. completely topless. There and also um, another weird one that they had was during the floor show. They didn't have corsets. They were dressed as uh, horses pulling Frank's chariot. Oh. Which was which was really interesting. And then superheroes was really weird because it was just Brad and Janet trotting around the stage. And like I guess they just were horses. So it was it was just really bizarre. That's my favorite episode of BoJack. <laughs> yeah, and like uh, Magenta and Columbia, or Magenta and Rick switched genders mm -hmm. for it. So Magenta was wearing like a Nike headband and like these big ears, and like Riff was wearing a Mickey Mouse sweatshirt. So it was just like they just did something totally different with it. It was nuts. <laughs> Uh, we're coming up on, uh, if anybody wanted to get anything else in, otherwise, uh, you know, we're coming up on two and Larry's raffle. Uh, I want to thank you so much for coming down and force uh, down here to our convention, crossing over a, a community line, so to speak, and a line that should no longer exist, really. But, you know, we do different things, but I, like I say, we're all about that big tent and making the community bigger and letting people's brains go in all directions. That's one of the funnest things of this community is letting that happen. I'm looking forward, I can't wait for the pre-shows tonight. And uh, anyway, thank you very much. Uh, before I say, let's play the music and for a quick five minutes, uh, bring Larry up here for the final panel event of the convention. Uh, anybody who can help us with breakdown uh, we're gonna have the uh, the stage needs to come down uh, at three o'clock, right when Larry's done. Uh, we'd appreciate some hands. Some of us have to run off to the stadium, but uh, anybody put out word to your friends. Hey, Garcia needs a little help here. We just want to try to get this stuff out of here as soon as possible. Uh, other than that, uh, thank you again for coming down here and joining us and sharing your ex your experiences with us and. Probably we got a lot more to talk about. So absolutely, thanks everybody. Thank you.